So, g'day, I'm Dr. Paul Mason, and today I'm going to discuss the somewhat contentious topic of corticosteroid injections. Now, corticosteroids are synthetic drugs that mimic cortisol, which is a hormone produced by the adrenal glands, and they have a powerful anti-inflammatory effect. They were discovered in the late 1930s by Nobel Prize winners Kendall and Reichstein and they soon became a mainstay for the treatment of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. As their usage grew, however, side effects soon became apparent. In effect, corticosteroids were a double-edged sword. On one hand, they were capable of rapidly alleviating disabling inflammation, but on the other hand, they could cause serious effects such as joint necrosis, osteoporosis and severe infection. Now one means of targeting joint inflammation while mitigating these systemic side effects is to directly inject steroids in a slow release depot compound that slowly solubilizes into an affected joint. Even so, they still remain a double-edged sword where their overall effect depends on the net balance of their effect on anabolism and catabolism. Connective tissues are constantly regenerating. In bone, this is referred to as coupling, where osteoclasts, which break down bone, are counterbalanced by the activity of osteoblasts, which build bone. And this delicate balance can be seen throughout the body in all its connective tissues, including articular cartilage. And inflammatory states can disrupt this balance by promoting proteases or enzymes which can degrade cartilage, articular cartilage. In effect, inflammation can lead to a net catabolic balance where the joint slowly degenerates. And this is worse with higher inflammation levels which are seen in autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. In effect, the unchecked inflammation causes joint destruction. So the corticosteroid injections can offer a real benefit. The other side of the coin, however, is that steroids also inhibit anabolic or building processes, which is obviously why bodybuilders typically avoid steroids of the corticosteroid variety. Moreover, not all inflammation is actually destructive. For example, in the case of a joint injury, like an ankle sprain, inflammation actually initiates healing. And studies in humans and animals show that corticosteroids impair tissue healing by actually impairing collagen production, actually weakening tendons, ligaments, what have you, increasing the risk of rupture. Indeed, even the attenuation of inflammation through cooling has been shown in some studies to have anti-anabolic effects. Cooling mice post-exercised with exercise-induced muscle injury has been associated with increased regions of muscle damage found afterwards. Research even has found in humans that we can blunten strength gains after training by putting them in an ice bath. And to the counter, there's some research demonstrating that hot water baths in humans can improve post-training recovery and strength gains. So in this context, inflammation is not universally harmful. It can be crucial for healing and suppressing it with corticosteroids can be deleterious. The point is though, in chronic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, where we have this huge maladaptive level of unbalanced inflammation, then we want to suppress that inflammation and that's where steroids offer the most benefit. It's not just inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis that we inject though. We often use corticosteroids in osteoarthritis, even though inflammation is much less prominent in this pathology. With osteoarthritis, the, the wear of the joints the cartilage degradation results in tiny fragments of articular cartilage. And this actually irritates the lining of the joint, the synovium, generating inflammation. This is quite similar 
to what occurs in gout where we have needle-shaped uric acid crystals actually irritating the lining of the joint, though obviously not as severe. And this explains the delayed joint swelling that we often see 24 or 48 hours after a cartilage or a meniscal type injury. So this histopathology report is from one of my patients a long time ago, a professional athlete whose knee used to swell up significantly every time he exercised. So every Monday I used to drain a significant amount of fluid from his knee and my understanding was that what was happening was that he was grinding away cartilage leading to this delayed inflammatory response. So as a part of the conversation I had with him about his retirement, we sent a sample of the fluid which I aspirated one Monday morning from his knee for analysis. And as you can see in the bottom line of the report there, they found articular cartilage fragments. Now, for a long time, the net effect of steroid injections in the condition of osteoarthritis wasn't clear. The initial research used x-ray to assess the thickness of cartilage. And these studies didn't really find any effect at all, beneficial or negative. In 2017, however, a study using MRI was published. And MRI is much more accurate for assessing the thickness of cartilage than X-ray. And that found that repeated injections over a two-year period led to a slight but significant decrease in cartilage thickness. So in effect, the jury is in. This doesn't necessarily mean, however, that corticosteroid injections don't have a role in osteoarthritis, because while they lead to a slight but significant decline in the thickness of the cartilage, it does reliably lead to a period of pain relief. On average, about four to six weeks, which many patients absolutely find worthwhile in terms of if they've got an upcoming holiday and they're going to be walking around cobblestone streets. Which then brings up the question of how many injections is too many. Now, the often quoted four injections per year limit is somewhat arbitrary and arises from a study in 1961. It was an observational study of about 8,000 patients who received a total of 235,000 injections. And over the period of observation in this study, there were 79 cases of osteonecrosis, or bone death. But this was only seen in the joints receiving the highest frequency of injection, at least one per month. Now, obviously, there's a big discrepancy between the four injections per year limit and the 12 plus per injections per year. So you can see that it is somewhat an arbitrary conclusion. Now, there has been subsequent research assessing this uh, theoretical limit of four injections per year in rheumatoid arthritis. So there was a study published in 1996 and it followed 13 rheumatoid arthritis patients for an average of 7.4 years, during which they received a total of 1,622 corticosteroid injections, an average of 16 injections per subject per year. And it was found that the most heavily injected joints did not demonstrate any accelerated destruction or decline. So clearly, the appropriate frequency of injection is not an arbitrary limit, but it varies according to the particular risk benefit profile in that patient. In terms of patients with osteoarthritis, however, if they're needing an injection more frequently than every three months, then we probably should be thinking about surgery which segues nicely into my next point. You see, corticosteroid injections have actually been shown to increase the risk of infection associated with hip joint replacement surgery, and likely other joint replacement surgeries too, although there is some, the research is limited. There was one observational study of 174,000 subjects who received hip replacements, and it found that subjects who received a steroid in the three months before the surgery had a 52% increased risk of infection by three months after the surgery. There's now an elephant in the room which I need to address, and that is a concurrent injection of local anaesthetic with corticosteroid. Now, the use of local anaesthetic can be fabulously helpful when it comes to diagnostic injections. If we want to determine whether a particular joint or a particular tissue is a source of pain, there is nothing better than local anaesthetic. 
The problem is, local anaesthetic is toxic to basically whatever tissue it comes into contact with, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage. And numerous lab-based studies have demonstrated the toxicity of even single-dose local anaesthetic exposure. And this is also not helped by the fact that degraded cartridge, think osteoarthritic cartilage, has been shown to be significantly more vulnerable to degradation by local anaesthetic. Now, the difference in the toxicity between isolated corticosteroid injections and these combined injections was nicely demonstrated in an observational study looking at osteoarthritic hip joints. So you'll recall that when steroid by itself was injected into knee joints, we saw a small but significant decline in cartilage thickness. Well, this study that looked at the combination of steroid plus local anaesthetic found that these injections were associated with an eight times increased risk of rapid joint destruction. And that was characterized by thinning of the cartilage, osteolysis, or even collapse of the femoral head. So my personal practice is that unless an injection is being used for diagnostic purposes, local anaesthetic should not be injected into the joint. And one method, which I know some of the surgeons here today do use, is that you pass the needle with local anaesthetic. We're, we're not mean here. We want to have pain relief where we can. You infiltrate the superficial tissues with the local anaesthetic. And as you pass the needle down, you'll often feel the pop as you pass through the synovium. The patient will often feel a sharp little sting. That's when you know you're in the joint. Leave the needle in place. Take off the syringe with the local anaesthetic and replace it with a syringe of steroid, and then we inject only steroid into the joint itself. Let's now address a couple of other prevalent corticosteroid injection myths. It's a common belief that you need to rest a joint for a week after a steroid injection. The reality is there's not much evidence for this. I did identify some research, one paper that showed that 24 hours of rest after a steroid injection performed into a highly inflamed joint. Think your rheumatoid arthritis type presentation did lead to some demonstrable benefit six weeks after. But in terms of benefit for osteoarthritis and so on and so forth, I really couldn't find much. The fact is rehabilitation exercises can probably commence within 24 hours after a steroid injection, and certainly within 48 hours. Now, I probably don't need to say this, but I will. Injecting tendons with corticosteroids is not good. Steroids impair tendon strength, and they increase the risk of tendon rupture. Furthermore, the actual act of injecting the tendon damages it. You can actually see Using high resolution UTC ultrasound, you can see the path of the needle that has been passed cross fiber into a tendon at least 18 months after injection. So it's reasonable to inject around a tendon if it's highly inflamed, but never into a tendon. Another complication is infection. And this is rare, but very potentially serious. Now, based on a study that was done in Iceland of all the joint injections done over a 13-year period, the infection rate is probably about 1 in 2,600. And there's other supportive studies that come out at about 1 in 3,000, so on and so forth. So that's probably about the ballpark. I particularly like that study, so I usually quote 1 in 2,600 injections. A much more common side effect is what we call a post-injection flare, and that affects about 2 to 6% of all patients. And a post-injection flare basically presents like a gout. It's severe, sudden swelling. Now, this often relates to the crystallization or crystals within the steroid. So using more soluble steroids like dexamethasone will actually reduce the risk of the post-injection flare. But the problem is you don't get that slow release depot effect and you, you get much more systemic effects because it gets absorbed into the circulation much more rapidly. So it sort of really is a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul if you're using the highly soluble uh, steroids for injection. Now, 
This might sound a little crazy, but when you're injecting, it's often helpful to know where the tip of the needle is. The, the fact is, many blind injections, and when I say a blind injection, that means performed without image guidance like ultrasound or CT scan, simply don't end up where they're meant to. So Burkhoff in 2012 published that only 72% of blind injections found their target. Now, both reassuring and also slightly concerning is that this increased to 95% when image guidance was used. We don't need to ask about that other 5%. But of course, this also depends on the complexity of injection. If you're injecting a knee, I mean, that, that's pretty simple and you don't really need image guidance for that. But if you're injecting a glenohumeral joint in the shoulder, I think you probably should. So in summary, corticosteroid injections are an incredibly valuable tool for suppressing inflammation and providing reliable short-term pain relief. Now the four injections per year rule is a general guideline that it's a bit arbitrary. The appropriate frequency for injection really depends on each patient's specific risk benefit profile. And when used judiciously, corticosteroids are a powerful strategy in managing joint disease. Now importantly, patient satisfaction depends on clear communication that helps set realistic expectations, including emphasising the fact that joint injections with steroid are for transient relief and very rarely with curative intent. Thank you.